My name is Leo Tiu, and that's my wife, Connie, over there. We live in Newmarket. I bet you, uh, you don't even know where that is. I know where Ottawa is. Everyone knows where Ottawa is, of course. This is our capital. It's good to be here with you this morning. I appreciate the invitation. Some of you I know, we go back, way back. Someone... Last night, I think it was, said you were baptized in our basement. How many years ago? How many? 25 years ago. So I've been around a while. Uh, you can probably tell. It's good to be here, though, to uh, be able to share with you a message from God's Word. I hope it will inspire, uh, inspire you and... Uh, in some ways, what I'm going to share today is a little morbid. We're going to talk about death. Now, we shouldn't really be afraid to talk about death because you're going to die. It's one of the lies that we like to tell ourselves that we'll live forever, but we don't. We won't. As you get older, you find out real quick uh, that you're not going to live forever. Your body starts to... Uh, you have, you have a best before date. And for me, many of us have passed that best before date. You know what I mean, right? The knees start to go, the hips start to go, uh, the eyes certainly go. You can see, uh, you know, Rob Groves up here, he needs those, uh, those reading glasses because once you hit 40, those things, something happens. Your retina doesn't work anymore and you can't see. You gotta have glasses. Anyway. Uh, in the beginning of January this year, I don't know, a couple days uh, after the beginning of the year, something happened that was pretty unbelievable. Uh, you don't, I don't know if you remember, but uh, they were, the people in Hawaii received an urgent uh, recorded message that said that bombs, uh, uh, nuclear missiles had been launched and were coming to destroy Hawaii. And it said, this is not a test. It is real. People panicked. Of course, you know, we know what's happened in North Korea and all of the talk about them developing nuclear missiles and they, they could reach the uh, continental United States. And so suddenly, we're thinking, you know, or they were thinking, Wow, he's sent a missile, he's going to destroy, and you know, we know what a nuclear missile will do. If you're on an island, you're in trouble. You can't get away, right? Uh, the reality is, you know, if it happened here, well, there's a missile coming to Ottawa, what would you do? You'd get in your car and you'd go as far as, you know, wherever, whatever direction you could get away. But you can't do that if you're on an island. I don't know how I start this... Uh, just press a button. And this morning, Hawaiian officials say they're determined to make sure that the false alarm that sent the entire state into panic never happens again. Yeah, for 38 minutes yesterday, people feared that there was a missile flying through the air and about to hit Hawaii. And it's because of this alert. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. And this is a warning that was sent to people's phones. They showed up on their TVs. They played on the radio stations across the state. State officials say all of this panic was caused by someone hitting the wrong button. And a federal investigation is now going to begin to figure out how one incident could cause this many problems. So CNN's Sarah Seidner is in Hawaii. Uh, she's got some more details for us this morning. Why were those people running? Think that through. You're running. It's a nuclear bomb. Unless you've got a bomb shelter somewhere that you're running to, you're all going up together. Could you imagine? 38 minutes, they thought that they were going to die. Have you ever received a message from your doctor that you're going to die? Most of us haven't. It's no fun. 
you begin to realize, and you know, what am I going to do? And you know, what's the next step? And you, 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 you go through all of this kind of uh, decision-making process. They were obviously running. I'm not sure what they were running to or why they were running. But the Bible says this, church, just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. Now, let me show you something here, okay? We as a people, right? We believe all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Do we not believe that the Bible is the word of God, that it is useful? And so if the Bible says that it's been destined, let me go back, it's been destined to die once, we know what? You're destined. You have a destiny with death. That's pretty morbid. Come on, man. I came to church to get some good news. Don't give me bad news. But the reality is that sometimes if you know that and you understand it, you can live your life better. You can make decisions about your future based on the reality. When I was 16, I thought I was immortal. Right? There's some 16-year-olds here. You know what I mean. You understand, man? Yeah, we're young. I'm just going to be super smart, and I'm going to be super rich. And, you know, you had it all figured out. And then the reality hits. And you're not going to be all of those things. And sometimes, even for 16-year-olds, death comes. Yesterday, one of the most moving things I've seen in a long time, that March... Not only in Washington, where there was over 500,000, half a million people were there, but marches all across the United States, all across the world. And uh, young people, it wasn't put on by the adults, it was put on by 16, 17, 18-year-old kids that were tired of going to school and being afraid that they might be shot. And this all comes from Parkdale, the, the high school in uh, Florida where 17 people lost their lives and 15 others were injured. And in six minutes, six minutes, and whatever, 20 or 30 seconds, all of these people died and were injured by one man, one fool. The reality is you don't know sometimes when death comes knocking, do you? You have a destiny, and that destiny you can't escape. There's, it doesn't matter how rich you are or how good looking you are or if you're a star, you can sing or act. It doesn't matter. Death comes to us all. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says, We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is is eternal. You know the reality, church? We got to live our lives looking at the things that you can't see because that's the real stuff. The real stuff isn't what you can see with your eyes. You get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you go, whoo, that's not real. That's just, a, that's just a temporary image that will disappear at some point. The reality is, church, that our eyes need to be fixed on what is unseen. The title of our lesson this morning is called 38 Minutes. If you had 38 minutes to live, what time is it? It's, I've got 20 after 11. 38 minutes would, if you had 38 minutes from now, what would you do? How would you feel? Your life could be very different. If you're studying the Bible and you're going, man, I don't know if I can make it. It's really hard to be a Christian, man. That sounds like a lot of commitment. I bet you those 38 minutes you'd say, no, I think I can make 38 minutes of commitment. I'm in. Right? If you had 38 minutes, what would you do? Well, maybe you'd call somebody. Last night we had this married Devo, and every one of these marrieds had a phone. Right? You don't have just one phone per family. You have one phone per person. We have one phone per family. Connie and I, we have one cell phone. We share it. it drives people nuts. 
They hate that. Because if they call that cell phone, they want the person that they think owns the cell phone answering. They don't want me answering. If I answer, it's like, oh, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. I'm her husband. Uh, we share the phone. You know what I'm saying? Last night, everyone had a phone. And I tell you, if you had 38 minutes to live and your spouse wasn't with you, I got a hunch you'd be calling. Honey, I'm going to die. Well, you might not say it like that, but you know what I'm saying. You'd want to say something. You want to do something. <coughs> Most important, what would you feel? About five years ago, I got a call. It was middle of February. There was snow up to my knees. I was outside with two of my sons, actually. They were, luckily, I've got big, strong boys, and they were helping their dad shovel the driveway. It was great. I got a call from my doctor. I'd been going through a bunch of tests. I had this heart issue going on. And uh, so my specialist calls me on the cell phone in the middle of a, you know, and I'm, <laughs> they call it heart attack snow. There's a reason. And he says, uh, yeah, I got some bad news. You have cardiomyopathy. Do you know what that means? I'm just like you. I don't know what that means. Doesn't sound good. It wasn't good. I mean, it means you have a sick heart, a diseased heart. And, uh, you know, they, we went through all the conversation and, yeah, yeah, you, you, you may need a pacemaker or we're going to put not only, they just, not just a pacemaker, they got to put a defibrillator pacemaker. And so I have that inside. It's like $35,000 right here, right, right, right there. My grandson loves it. I told him all about it. He said, Grandpa, when you're done with it, can I have it? I said, sure, son. It's yours. But anyway, so now I've got a defibrillator, heart, you know, monitor, blah, 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 blah. The problem is my heart is diseased. It's sick. It doesn't function. Uh, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It doesn't pump blood the way it's supposed to. I don't know how I got it. He doesn't know either. You get a call like that, and it's like, I walked up to the boys. I said, well, it's been a great ride, boys. I was kind of a little morbid. I said, it sounds like it's the end. No, it wasn't the end. I mean, I'm still here after, what, four years. But you think about it. You get a call like that, and you go, whoo, the end. What am I going to do? How do you act, church? Do you tell the people that you've been maybe holding back and saying, you know, well, I should tell them I love them, and you don't? Grab your, your wife in your arms and tell her how much she means to you. you. You grab your kids. Like, if you had 38 minutes to live, 38 minutes, okay? That's not a lot of time. I'm going to tell you something here, okay? This is the most important thing I'm going to tell you today, the secret of life. You've got to write this down. Because this is the most important thing that you'll ever hear in all of your life. I'm being facetious. You know that, of course. The secret of life is what? Do not allow the urgent to divert you from the important. The battle you have every day in your life is between the urgent and the important. What's urgent? Well, if you have a baby and they have a dirty diaper, that's urgent, you know, especially if you're in a car. You, you, get, the, you get the concept, okay? I got to deal with this. Okay, that's urgent. You deal with it. But that's not important. It's important for a moment. But that's not the important thing of life. That's not what you devote your life to. That's not what you're living for. That's not the, the, the peace that you desire when you put your head on the pillow and you try to go to sleep at night. You see, you need to have the important things of life to help shape who you are. There are four reasons, church, that we are diverted from important things in our life. I'm going to share them with you. The number one thing is routine. How many of you commute to work? Hands up. An hour. Who, who commutes an hour? One, two, three. What's that? You mean you don't? There's a couple. There's three guys that had their hand up. 
20 minutes. Okay, yeah. Oh, it's Ottawa. Oh. Like Big Bad Toronto. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, <laughs> I understand. Okay. I'm with you. I'm 100%. Anyway, doesn't that drive you crazy? What do you do when you commute for an hour or 20 minutes? You're, you're, you're held captive in your car or in a, in a train or on a bus, right? What do you do? Call friends, yeah, now that we have cell phones, we talk, right? Talk to people, you can do that. Listen to music, yeah. Pray, okay, yeah. You can read your Bible, yeah. All kinds of, find, find another job, yeah. Routine, church, it is mind-numbing, soul-stealing. You just, you, you, the end of a day and you're really, really tired and you got to get in that car and drive home and then you hit that traffic and some goof, you know, got in an accident, and pile up and now it's even going to be longer and you're just like, oh, my life. <laughs> Routine can numb us to the very important things of life. What's important in your life? If you had to let, make a list of one, two, three, or four, five most important things in your life. What would they be? Do you focus on that every day? I hope so. Each day must be lived with a renewed focus on who is important. What is important, sorry. What is important in your life, church? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 17. If you're a disciple today, you probably got this scripture probably... The first or second study. It's called the Word of God. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day. You see, they suddenly had a new important thing in their life. Now, the fact that they even had scriptures blows me away because <laughs> Bibles didn't, you know, they weren't just laying around back then. But they were able to search the scriptures on a daily basis trying to find the truth. You say important things. How important is it to read the Bible? You can't escape your past or your sin or your sinful nature without understanding God's view. You got to understand what God thinks about sin, what, what God thinks about what you're doing to get the right perspective and go in the right direction. So the Bible is the, is, is the avenue whereby God sends us messages and, and, and prepares us for a daily routine or yearly or a lifetime routine, right? First Peter chapter 3. Verse 15, but in our hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer uh, for the uh, hope that you ha have. But do this with uh, gentleness and respect. We must be able to, in reverence and respect, give an answer to anyone who asks us. Well, I hear you're a Christian. Tell me about that. You say, we must be prepared to allow God to talk to us, and then that message that God gives us is that which we give back to people who ask us, why do you live the way you live? Why do you act the way you act? If you had 38 minutes to live, would you change something about your Christianity? Think about that. If you said yes... And my question is, why don't you change it? Because you know you're going to die, you're going to change it? Well, if you're going to live, you should change it too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've been, I've been reading to repent of that. Okay, I will. I've only got 38 minutes. I better change. Seriously? Then you don't know what it is to be a disciple. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father 
and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. See, Jesus has a direction. He wants people, if you've got 38 minutes left, as a church, we ought to be going, hey, man, I finally get to go to be part of the heavenly church. Not in fear, but in joy. Not with resentment, but with anticipation. The best song leaders, the best preachers, <laughs> the best people. You know what I'm saying, man? It's like good news, right? 38 minutes and I'm going to be with Jesus. While I'm there, sign me up. We're tired. Are you tired this morning, church? Everybody's tired. I don't know why. Maybe I have sleep apnea. I don't know. But we're all tired. You get tired of the, the monotony of life. You get up, you eat your breakfast, you get those kids ready, you take them to school, you go to work, you put in your eight or nine or ten hours, you drive home, you come home, have, have supper, uh, you, you help the kids with a little bit of homework, you put them to bed, Meanwhile, you're doing laundry or whatever because that's got to get done because kids can go through a lot of that. And then guess what? By 10, 11, 12, you put your head on the pillow and you start all over again the next morning. <laughs> Isn't that boring? It shouldn't really be because if you've got kids, you're really blessed. If you got a wife or a husband, you're really blessed. If you got a job, you're really blessed. Yeah, you, all of those things may be true, but yeah, man, it's, it's tiring. Kids are the most tiring thing in the world. I'm telling you, since Connie and I have retired, and since we've retired, we've become full-time nannies to our grandkids. We get calls all the time. We've got to drive them here. We got to pick them up there. We got to watch them because it's a PA day. We got this one's sick. We got it, you know, they're all parents are all working. So grandma and grandpa are the ones. Come on, pinch hit for us here, guys. We're tired. <laughs> they're not even our kids. Well they are our kids, they're our grandkids, but it's like, wow, we didn't have that when we were raising kids. Our grandparents were like 500 miles away. The numbing routine of our lives makes us tired, church. We get tired, and guess what you do when you get tired? You focus on yourself. You're too uh, young, probably. Some of you may remember, but uh, McDonald's in the 70s and 80s had this theme. You deserve a break today. Do you remember that? They'd show these happy little people running into McDonald's, getting a little burger and some fries and a drink. You deserve a break today because you work so hard. It's so tough. Your life is so bad. And McDonald's will make you happy. <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, you don't deserve a break today. Do your kids really think that you should get a break? My grandkids, these are my grandkids. They get angry at us. One particular, we've got this one. He's like, we go away for a holiday somewhere, and he's like, I want to come. Well, you can't because you got school, and your parents won't let you. But why can you go? Okay, <laughs> we're the grandparents. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Don't guilt me out. You, I know. You, you kids are good at throwing the guilt around. Like, yeah, but it should be for us. I want to go. I never get to go when you go on holiday. Too bad, buddy. Here, you get what I'm saying, man? We get so tired and we get so self-focused. It's, it's like, I need a break. I'm so... <laughs> what did Jesus say? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself. Take up their cross daily, not once a week when you go to church, daily, and follow me. You see, you don't deserve, you do not deserve a break today. God doesn't care that you need a break. 
Oh, please, God, love me so much that you give me a holiday in Cancun. Don't work that way. <laughs> Third point, money. This is a big one, okay? It really is. A lack of money or too much money. Either way, it works both ways. Keeps us from focusing on the important things of life. <coughs> you got to understand this, church. We're a rich nation. Unbelievable. My, my son, one of my sons lives in the United States, lives in Arkansas. He pays about $7,000 a year for health care. And he's not sick. None of his kids are sick. That's what it costs if you have health care in the United States. And his, he's got, you know, his company gives him health care. But they have, um, what do they call it? Copay, whatever, I don't know. So anytime they go to the doctor, it, it costs them. And last year it was about $6,000, $7,000. Do you know how much you pay? I think it's like 400 bucks per person, something like that, 500 bucks. It, it's in there in your tax return. You'll, you'll find it somewhere in there. I don't know. I don't remember how much. It's so little, I don't even know what it is. This is the country we live in? Now they want to throw drugs at us. Well, I shouldn't put it like that. That's the prime minister and marijuana. But no, no, I'm talking about, you know, the co the, the uh, copay drugs or whatever they call that, you know, now for anyone 25 and under. And then they changed it to those 65 and over, which, hey, that, that fits me. I'm 65. What a country we live in. We are incredibly blessed. You are so wealthy, you can't even imagine what people that live in other parts of the world would do to have your life. And yet we complain, right? Well, the government doesn't give us enough. They take too much in taxes. It's too cold here. It's too hot here. It's too humid here. It's too dry here. It's too whatever here. We are complainers. We're professional complainers. We need to start focusing on the important things in life. Money is not one of them, okay? What's the Bible say? The love of money. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money can destroy your life. It can destroy your marriage. It can destroy your relationship with your kids. It can cause you the greatest pain in your life. If you don't know how to handle money, you better get that worked out. Because it's dangerous stuff. What else? Philippians 4, 11 through 13. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content. There's another secret for you. Are you content? We lived in Africa for a year. In Africa, it's very different. Very, very different. The culture is very different than of North America and Canada. And uh, you know, when we came back, the thing that, that I found the most disturbing about Canadians is how malcontent they are, how filled with angst and worry they are. If they saw real poverty, like in Africa, they don't, you, first of all, you don't have old age plans, you know, old age security. You don't have CPP. You don't have welfare. You don't, if you are poor, you're not getting anything from the government. We're like, wait a minute. Yeah. There's, when, when people are begging, some, some are professional beggars, I know that, but most people that are begging are genuinely poor. They have no money. Wow. That's tough. You come back and people are living the life that anybody in, in Africa would love to have, and they're complaining about the life that they have. Telling you, church, we got to be very careful. 
We got to be very careful. Be content. Are you content? I hope so. Fourth thing, pride. Here's the killer. We're filled with pride by nature. We struggle. We struggle with humility. The Bible says pride goes before destruction. Sometimes political leaders can be filled with pride. Nebuchadnezzar, you remember that dude? He stood there and said, wow, look at this beautiful city that I've built by my power and my greatness. And then what was he doing? He was eating grass. Literally, he was eating grass. Now, you could take that into the modern day and substitute a different name maybe. But it can happen. Oh, no, no. It will happen. Pride goes before destruction. Isn't that why Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven? He wants you to be poor in spirit because there is the avenue for success. If you're prideful by nature, and we all are, you better deal with that because it can destroy your life. You got 38 minutes to live. Guess what? You're not standing there saying, yeah, I'm the best of all these people that are going to die. Aren't I the best? Aren't I the greatest? Aren't I the smartest? Aren't I the richest? Suddenly, every, you know, the, the playing field is all level. We're all going together in 38 minutes. Oh, okay. Better humble up. Better find out what God wants if I had time to find out what God wants. Pride never, the proud never see themselves the way God sees them. Think about that, eh? Pride, prideful people never see themselves. You know what prideful people always say? They're humble. <laughs> it's scary. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm so humble. Oh, my goodness. And they don't change to be what God wants them to be. We better change. We better, we better recognize what God wants in, in humility and seek humility above pride because that's to be like Jesus, to be like God. In Matthew 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In conclusion, church, what are we even talking about? you got 38 minutes to live. It's been about... I don't know, 25 minutes? What, it, it, what is it? 25? Okay. You got, uh, what's that, 13 minutes left, church? What are you going to do? How are you going to live? The four reasons that we gave this morning. Number one, routine. Number two, being tired. Number three, money. Number four, pride. You know what? If you, if you absolutely knew that you were going to die in 13 minutes, None of these things, you wouldn't be tired anymore. You wouldn't worry about routine. You wouldn't worry about how much money you had in your pocket or didn't have. And you certainly would be much more humble. What's important? You gotta get, the, you always gotta remember, okay? It's, a, it's the important things that we've gotta focus on. And not allow the urgent things of life to get us diverted from what is important. <coughs> In Psalm 1, blessed is the one who does not walk in, the, in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. You know, I have a, a friend, a good friend, actually, um, Guy and Kathy Hammond. I think you know them. Guy's preached here before. Uh, Kathy's going through some very difficult times. I don't know if you know, but she has a brain tumor. What's it called, honey? Blioblastoma something? Something blastoma, whatever that means. I don't know. But uh, she went through a lot of different things to try to remove the tumor, it's inside of her head. It didn't, it's growing. And they told her that she would die. 
and she will die. There's no doubt about it. You can see this was last September, I think, and so it's been maybe six, seven months. But you know the thing that's so convicting and so inspiring at the same time? She knows that she's going to die, and she's living her life in a way that is a model for the rest of us to follow. We're, gonna, we're dying too. We could die before her. We don't know that. That's the difference. She knows. But we may die on the way home. You don't know that. But the reality is that she's living her life filled with joy. And one of the things, she's just, she's got like a bucket list of things she wants to do. One of the things she suddenly decided, she's in a wheelchair now, she, does, she wanted to go out on the ice. She wanted to play hockey, actually. Good Canadian. Uh, but she wanted to go on the ice. So her husband took her out on the ice. <laughs> wow. Go, honey. It's like you're in the Olympics. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You are definitely getting all tens from me, honey. Wow. Amazing. Oh, yes. There you go. Can you do a trolley? <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. Oh my gosh, honey. You're the best Olympic person going. Isn't that the way to go if you had 38 minutes? To have that kind of conviction, that kind of joy, that kind of spirit? It's true, church. You're going you're gonna to die. Scripture doesn't lie. We read it. You've been destined to die. It's coming. You just don't know when. So stop living a life that isn't in keeping with what God wants and start living the life that will bring you the joy so that you, at the end, you know, you can go out on the ice and do your Paralympic skating twirl, whatever. Just, you know, enjoying the, the time that's left, looking forward to the eternity that you'll have with Jesus. Amen.